anniversary yesterday of broadcasting webinars and now podcasts. So thank you for joining us this evening. It's December 19th, 2017. Tonight is our, our second in a series uh, of reviews of a review of the book Nurture Shock, The New Science About Children. And really what I like about this book and, and why I chose this book is because not only does it bring a fresh perspective, but it doesn't necessarily tell you what to do with the information. It, it informs you so then you can make a decision that, that's based on what you feel, who you are, who your child is, and this new science. And so it brings to light many things that I, I think that we have taken for granted, many things that we have assumed are common sense and challenges those myths and beliefs. I think one of my favorite parts about doing parent education for, for Evoke is this idea that parents come to sometimes where they realize that some of the most basic assumptions, not only about children that we have, but also about relationships and psychology we have, need to be challenged. And then when we open ourselves up to challenging those assumptions, we open ourselves up to a whole lot of new truth. I'm not going to review every chapter in this book because I think some are more worthy of a review than others. So skipping a couple of chapters, specifically two and three, they talk about more sleep and the science behind that. This also speaks back to some of the ideas that I had learned about when I was in college, even, even my undergrad, about how so many things that we think of as, as modern conveniences, that we think of, at, of a, a saving time, end up costing us more time. So many of the modern conveniences. One of the simple examples is, is like a vacuum cleaner, something we think will save us time compared to the old way, whereas in the old, before vacuum cleaners, before electricity even, families would only vacuum their house once or twice a week. And what they would do is they would do it as a family because it took more, more than one person to drag the rug outside. And so, so many of the things that we take for granted, like sleep and work and school, um, are, are at times robbing us of some of the old lessons that we have in life. Children need more sleep. They're getting less sleep due to activities and, and school start, start times. This is contributing to lower scores, mood, and health issues. There, there's a chapter in there about racism. Again, I'm giving you a very broad overview of these two chapters because I'm, I'm not going to be discussing them tonight. But basically the idea that talking about race in children, uh, two children, is the most important thing that we can do to have healthy attitudes towards race and differences. There's this assumption that they challenge in the book about this idea that when parents have this attitude that we don't see color, we don't see race, and we don't talk about it, that it doesn't lend itself in children to seeing equality, to, to, to seeing the value of diversity and equality in our culture. So if you want to learn more, you can, you can go and read those. So let's talk about lying. Let's talk about deception. That's what tonight's chapter is on, chapter four. Uh, the idea, first of all, the contrast between lying and, and denial. I've heard some people, lay people, talk about the idea that, that it's impossible to lie to oneself. And, and we know that that's not true. We know that one can be so motivated to not see the truth in their life that it's, it's essentially like lying to yourself. When we talk about your child in the wilderness, you know, we're often talking about denial when we're, when we're talking about lying. This idea that your child isn't aware of. We talk about your child sometimes, their progress, their disclosures. When we do parent coaching with you all, we talk about it like it's a conscious process. And in many ways, it's, a, it's not a conscious process. And, and denial is the, the psyches, the self's uh, inability to incorporate, to integrate all of one's truths. It essentially is born out of shame, right? This idea that if I am who I really am, that I won't be loved or accepted. And that's a huge fuel, a huge motivator to denial. So I, I want to distinguish between those things right now because I think sometimes we, we blur them. And often when we're giving you our reports, when even when I'm teaching at times, I'm really talking about denial more than I am about lying. Lying, of course, is something we have to consider in terms of our own boundaries as parents. What are we going to be comfortable with? What are we going to challenge? What are we going to, to highlight? And there's some really interesting ideas in this chapter about how we as parents uh, undermine the, the idea of honesty in our families, that we most parents list it as one of their primary values, and yet there's so many subtleties in the research in this book that I think illustrate that we don't act as if it's one of our values. We don't act as, as if it's something that we, that we value both in ourselves and in our children. And in some ways, we actually 
teach our children how to lie. We, we teach them about lying. So we'll talk about that tonight. We lie because we have anxiety. We lie because we want to please. We want to be accepted. Ultimately, we lie because we want to control somebody else, their perceptions, right? what they think about us, how they view us, right? How, what, what our, our, we manage our image of them. We want them to think and feel a certain way. And that goes with exaggerations and without right lie. You know, sometimes children will lie because it's, it's a shame issue, right? I don't want to be seen as bad. I don't want to be seen as unappealing. Right? There's a shame to it. And sometimes we lie because of the consequences. Right? We don't want to get in trouble. That is, children don't want to get in trouble. Or we as adults don't want to get in trouble. Um, we want praise. We want attention. It, some of the fascinating studies in this chapter are about how children seem to beam with a sense of pride after cheating during, during a research study and lying about it. But still that praise is, is something that is so intoxicating to, to children and to us that even to be praised for something that we are not for an, for an inauthentic version of ourselves is still a very intoxicating feeling especially for young children and of course the re re the rewards that come along with it are something that we all enjoy one of the questions that i have parents ask me all the time and i was thinking about this while i was rereading this chapter for for tonight's webinar and i was thinking about it in terms of the question that gets asked asked of me so often, you know, when I'm when I'm reporting on a child or, or describing a child's their, their behavior, their their weak in the wilderness to a parent, the question often comes up: Is he telling the truth? Is he, is he just selling this to us? And I think it's more subtle, more complex than that. I think what most parents are really hoping is: Is this a lasting change? Is this evidence of, of a genuine? change and of, of lasting change because i think a lot of children believe what they're telling us similar to the way a lot of us can relate to the idea when you set a new year's resolution when you set a goal for a diet or to watch less tv or, or, or to exercise whatever you think it might be at the time you make that promise to yourself even you believe it but does it has does it have legs do you have the, the capacity to follow through on this so when parents ask me about this, I say, that's not the right question to ask. Is he telling the truth or is she telling the truth? The question requires you to take a step back and be objective and to be able to see your child. One of the messages that comes through in this chapter that is a major point that I often examine, explain to parents is this idea. You love your child the most. That is not up for argument. But I think a lot of parents imagine that they see their child the clearest. And that is often not true. In fact, and I'll talk about this as we go, parents were the least reliable in studies when assessing whether or not children were telling the truth. They were the least capable of identifying a lie versus something that was true. And they imagined that they were much better at it than they really were. And they often overestimated in their children, their children telling the truth. So again, it, it asks you to take a step back. We're reviewing our, our, our dog policy at, at Evoke, right? To make sure that we have dogs in the field and to make sure that, that we're getting the right dogs in the field. One thing I've learned about reviewing this policy is that the owners of the dogs don't see their dogs as clearly as others, right? They have a, a Pollyannish view of their own dog, whether or not their dog minds, annoys people, is, is, is compliant or obedient. It's hard for us when we're that close to, to a dog even, or to a child, to see them very clearly. And so that's one of the benefits of having a child in a program with a therapist, is they begin to provide to you a, another view of your child, something maybe a perspective that you haven't been able to see yourself because you're so close to it, and because you have such strong identification with them. A lot of the research in this chapter comes from a researcher named Victoria Talwa. So she contributes a lot to it. Like I said, people cannot tell when children are lying. Many of the indicators of lying in adults, pupil dilation, voice pitch, etc., do not hold true for, true for children. Right? It's almost as if 
they believe that they're telling the truth. A lot of parents believe that boys lie more often than, than girls. That's not true. The science doesn't hold up. A lot of parents, a lot of people believe that younger kids lie more often, and that's not true. Children actually, in many ways, learn to lie and become more sophisticated uh, with it as they go. They see us as parents lying. And again, most often, we would categorize these lies as white lies. But to a young child, even a mistake is seen as a lie. They paint with one brush. There's an example in the chapter of a father who promises his son to take him to a certain activity. Finds out later that mom, because they hadn't talked about it, had already committed her son to something else that they couldn't get out of. And the young boy could not see that as, as simply a mistake or, or not, uh, not having all the information, an accident, but called it a lie. Another mother when talking to a, to a babysitter and sharing with the babysitter the age of the child as six years old, whereas the boy was a week away from his sixth birthday. The boy got very upset with his mother on the phone call, and it was later explained that the, the reason he was so upset because he wasn't literally six. And other examples of white lies that we tell, lies that we tell to make people feel okay or to, to get out of awkward social situations. Children learn from that interaction that it's okay to lie if you have another's feelings in mind. If you're trying, and, and this is important, even if that feeling is you're trying to please a parent. In other words, if I lie to make mom and dad happy, it's okay. It falls under the same category as white lies. So a lot of people believe that introverts lie more than others. They're quiet, not to be trusted. And that also is false. Our perceptions. Police are the worst judges of lying. Less than half uh, right. Parents can tell just about 50% of the time whether their own children are lying. And they insist that they are much better than that. Teachers can identify it about 60% of the time. But they believe and get very upset when they're not 100% accurate. And they contend that if it were their own students, they could see it. All groups that are studied are very upset by their vulnerability to, to not being able to tell the difference between somebody telling the truth and a lie. I love wilderness therapy. I love working with children out in the wilderness, adolescents and, and young adult children, and with parents, because that, that distance provides everybody the opportunity. Take a step back, slow down. You don't have to come to conclusions as quickly. You don't have to make decisions based on what your child is supporting, reporting. Taking a wait and see attitude. And, and one of the things that they talk about in this chapter is learning to slow down. Learning to slow down when a child tells a lie. Learning to slow down when there's a situation where we ask a child something and it's a, in their mind it's a no-win situation. If I tell the truth, I'm going to get in trouble. And so I might as well lie to get out of it. In asking something, I remember one time I asked this during an incredibly charged interaction with my son. I found out years ago when he was a young teenager that he had been unkind to somebody in the neighborhood who had a young, younger boy who had some developmental delays. And of course, I was horrified by that. Socially, I was embarrassed. Right? Personally, I was hurt by that and this idea. I was angry that it was my family, my son was a part of that. So after hearing the story when my son, son came home, I went to confront him. And I asked him this question. I said, did it make you feel big? Did it make you feel big? Picking on somebody that was compromised, more vulnerable than you, smaller than you were. And of course, there's a no-win situation, right? That, that's, you can't win that situation. Because if you say no, I'm, I'm going to call you on it and say, that, then why did you do it? And if you say yes, and he had the audacity to tell me the truth, which didn't make me feel any better, and I got more angry in reaction. Right? I, I set him in a situation where there was, uh, there was no winning in the situation. Younger children lie but admit it, starting at three. As they grow up, they lie and deny it and extend the line. That starts typically at four. 
one of the points that the researchers make in this book is that a lot of parents are, of course, really uncomfortable when you, with young children lie, and they do it fairly frequently. But the fact of the matter is most of them don't grow up to be sociopaths, right? So we need to, again, be, be careful, take a step back, and recognize there's some developmental issues with this, and there's some psychology with this, and there's some family dynamics with this that we can better evaluate. I'll talk about those as we go along a little farther. Having older siblings means that children lie earlier. Knowing what a lie is and being taught uh, and old enough to understand actually increases the, lack, the likelihood of lying. Like the more sophisticated they, they get, the more they tend to lie. Four-year-olds lie about once every two hours. Six-year-olds lie about once per hour. And 96% of children lie. So again, it's just to give you some perspective, a reality check, that if you have a difficulty with your child, and, and if they get rewarded and reinforced for their lie, it tends to be exacerbated, right, to be increased in adolescence and young adulthood. And so that it takes a lot of takes a lot of energy to turn that barge around, to start rewarding children for telling the truth, to start to acknowledge it, to start to see where we set them up in situations, and to, to start to own our own patterns of dishonesty, and to recognize how difficult that it can be, that we tell what we would consider white lies, but oftentimes they're just lies to get out of a, of a social situation, like I said earlier. Children tend to consider any mistruth or mistake as a lie and bad, right? like I said earlier. Just speaking to a, to a babysitter about a five-year-old who's going to turn six in a week and saying he's six, the child sees as, as wrong. Adults, as adults, we qualify white lies, mistakes and misinformation, and new information, etc. But children aren't capable of doing that. So again, slowing it down, talking about it, understanding where the child is coming from, explaining where we can. That's part of the, the takeaway from this. Those are things we can do with this information. Intelligence and cognitive capacity increases lying and its complexity, right? Children are, young people are, are more capable of measuring the consequences, uh, of seeing the, again, if a child lies for something, about something, to avoid getting in trouble, and they, they don't get in more trouble for lying later on, then for them there's no cost to lie. There's no loss. You're no worse off if you lie. So paying attention to that process. I've worked with families recently where I've said some of the, some of the times when I've trusted your child the most is when they have told us and you something that we're likely to be upset about, not like maybe even have an angry reaction and response to the child. Those are indications of some of the most courageous things. I'm always, always hesitant when a client, any client, starts to try to sell something to be good. Because in therapy, in, in the pure sense, the goal isn't to go in and, and convince your therapist that you're a good person, right? That you're honorable and wonderful. The goal is to go in there and be you and take the risk that you might have a different reaction than you had in your other contexts. I had a friend after years of going to therapy, I checked, I were talking casually one time, he knows that I go to therapy for years, and I, I asked him, how's therapy, do you still go? And he said, no, and I said, is it the cost, what, what, what happened? And he said, I found myself just lying to my therapist. And I laughed and I said, everybody lies to the therapist. That's part of the process. And I had a client recently who said, you know, I could pull one over on you. This is an adult client. And I said, it would be okay. That would be part of the process. Part of the process is taking the risk of showing up authentically. With the possibility that somebody could react with anger, with disappointment, with disgust, with judgment, and that's the challenge. So we lie to avoid con consequences, both in our lives and also in the relationship. We lie to avoid hurting others. Again, I, I want to make this point really clear because this is the crux of a lot of my work 
and it shows up in this chapter somewhat. Children, when they feel responsible to make their parents feel proud and happy, are more inclined to lie. And the story that they tell themselves is, I'm making my father and mother happy. So that's why when I talk about it, it's not a child's job to make a parent happy. When we can take that dynamic out of the equation, we encourage more truth telling. My therapist has told me many times over the past 19 years, this idea that um, when she was raising her son, that so many people were flabbergasted by what she allowed her son to say to her. And what she would say, or have a hard time explaining is, I, I want him to tell me the things. And sometimes he says it in an obnoxious way, but I want him to tell me when he's upset or angry with me or doesn't like me or isn't happy. Those are important. So we have to be responsible, right? Take responsibility for our own emotions as parents. They don't say it in this chapter. This is my conclusion. This is the, what I teach in order to allow our children to show up and be, be themselves and be authentic. Even the example they use, think about a child receiving a gift that they don't like. How hard for it, how well do we do as parents in allowing them to have their natural reaction? Or do we teach them to put on a happy face even when not, they're not happy with the gift? And how are they supposed to, as young children, distinguish between showing up honestly in other ways versus what we're teaching them in those instances, which means lie to make other people feel better. So that's a very important part of this chapter, is where's the motivation? Are we unconsciously part of the process with them and encouraging them to lie? We lie to increase the power and control and decrease shame. I've talked about that. And then, of course, lying may continue both because it is reinforced, because it works, and also because it's an effective way of coping with our discomfort. Paying attention to the lies that cover up other things is important. They talk about in this chapter when, when teaching or valuing honesty, can we slow down the process enough to talk about the cover-ups, right? The lies that start to extend themselves. Can we fa find ways to distinguish between our levels of consequences between somebody who is being honest? One of the things that I found in, in working with my son eight years ago when he was a mid-teenager around drugs and alcohol, which were one of his issues, was could I start to respond in a way that didn't treat everything like it was a nail and I was the hammer? Could I open up a dialogue and listen? Could I back away from zero tolerance? I was not a parent that was at risk of denial. I was not that parent. For many of our parents, that's their challenge. That was not my challenge. My challenge was more overreacting and controlling. So I found, for me and my son and my family, I had to learn to back up a little bit and listen. And what I found was my son started to talk to me more and tell me things that were really hard to hear and very scary. And it's true at that time. And I told him this, this, I, this, this thing for, to, to this day. I almost sent him away to another program because I was getting worried about his drug habit because he was telling me the truth. I think a lot of parents would be frightened if the children were telling them the truth. But I sensed that he was a part of the solution that he was working towards a solution. I had a program in my back pocket. I had his consultant on the phone several times, and I was ready to pull the trigger. But I, but I listened. And I was looking toward that long-term goal, a more honest, open relationship. And around this time, when I was almost ready to send him, and he was being honest with me, he got himself clean and sober and has been for eight years, almost nine years. Not saying that's the, the paradigm for everybody, but I'm saying in that instance, I slowed it down, I changed the pattern, I wanted open communication, I paid more attention to that than I did to even my fear and anxiety and to compliance with what I wanted. They give the example, of, this is in one of the research study of the boy who cried wolf story, where the wolf 
ends up eating the boy and the sheep also, versus the story of George Washington and the cherry tree. Of course, for lying, in the first story, the boy suffers the most horrendous consequence, right, being eaten by the wolf. Whereas in the story of George and chopping down the cherry tree with his new hatchet, his father praises his honesty, says something along the lines of, I, I would rather have you tell me the truth than have a uh, hundred cherry trees. So his father paid attention to that even more. After listening to these stories, children who, who read and studied the story of the boy who cried wolf, not only didn't tell the truth more often in subsequent parts of the study, they tended to lie even more, which is amazing. 75% of the parents that listened predicted that the boy that cried wolf would be a better deterrent for lying. But in fact, it was the children that had studied the story of George Washington and the cherry tree. And these, by the way, were Canadian families. So they didn't associate with with George Washington's stardom, right, his celebrity, being the founding of the father and all. In fact, they ended up changing the study to be a generic young boy in the cherry tree story. But because the boy was praised specifically for telling the truth, this led to, to children being more honest. And this goes back to something with the weakness of punishment, which is what the boy who cried wolf received. Punishment isn't something that we don't utilize as parents and as, as therapists. Punishment is an aversive consequence, an adverse consequence for behavior that we want to see go away, right? Subside. But the weakness of punishment, there's a few weaknesses. Number one, and I'm, I'm, I'm going off track, but it relates to this, and I think it's informative. Number one, it can, it can be an expression of anger and frustration, very little to do with what the child needs. That's the first vulnerability of punishment. Number two, it doesn't tell somebody what to do. And number three, and related to number two, is people just learn to get around it, to lie even better. A simple example is the, the, the speed limit, right? The speed limit sign. We all know how to speed and not get caught. We know how to look for cops. We're not really not speeding. We're just learning to avoid punishment. So that's another weakness of punishment. Strength with reward is that it tells people what to do, specifically. In the case of George Washington and the cherry tree, it is to tell the truth. So that's something, again, we can slow down with our children. Take our time. Don't feel rushed. Don't feel pressured to do something quickly. But start to pay attention to the, the, the subject, the dynamics of honesty and, and truth-telling when we're dealing with our children. Removal of punishment or promise of immunity doesn't decrease lying, right? Because children still know that their parents are going to be disappointed. So if you tell me the truth, son or daughter, junior, the consequence won't be as severe, or maybe even not at all. But the fact of the matter, what children are so much more paying attention to so much more is whether or not mom and dad are happy or upset. So again, it goes back to that idea, that, that thing that I talk about, be responsible, own your own emotions. Make that the culture in your home. We're talking about literally being responsible for your own feelings and literally having that not to do with your child. It's not your responsibility. You can't make me happy or sad. It's not your job. This is my reaction. I own it. It comes from me. And then, of course, rewards for honesty, like I said, do have positive effects. Adults, they, they talk about the impact of, of us as parents and adults on children. Adults average one lie about every five social interactions. White lies, convenience lies, taxes, speeding, etc. That turns out to be about once a day. I guess if you're driving, it's more than once a day because you're most of us aren't going under the speed limit the entire day. 25% of preschoolers white lie, 50% of elementary age li white lie. So the white lying increases, right? We maintain our, our social standing by, by pleasing others and telling them what, what they want to hear. Of course, for children, like I said, it's not so clear. They blur the line between white lies and making their parents feel good. I didn't waste my money on buying the Pokemon cards, you asked. 
because I know you're going to be upset. And, and I haven't said this tonight, but I'm going to go and say this. I think so much of what we do as parents is we use our emotional intensity to reinforce or discourage behavior, right? I, I think with people unlike yourself who have, haven't been through programs like Evoke, and most of you, this isn't your first go around, right? You've had other therapists and other therapeutic things that you've tried even before Evoke, if it, even if it was just an outpatient therapist setting. People that don't go through what you're going, the, the average person thinks it's perfectly appropriate to parent in that way, that my anger and frustration and expressing that to you is how I change your behavior. My feeling happy or proud of you is how I reinforce your behavior. And this becomes problematic in many ways. And in this chapter, we're specifically talking about how it impacts time. One of the things they talk about is we, we talk about it, and teachers report that tattling is, is the bane of their existence, right? And children are often told, don't tell. But what we really mean is we want you to work it out yourselves. And children can use tattling to manipulate each other, to gain social standing, right? It can be used manipulatively. So telling them not to tell, it's not, it's not a kind of a, something we can paint with, with one brush. We have to, again, slow it down and understand. And children also are frustrated because they don't tattle on everything, right? From their perspective, when they get punished for tattling, when they get chastised for tattling, in their experience, they're being asked to lie in some respects. And what's not noted in that interaction is the 10 things that they didn't tattle about. So again, we need to be aware of what messes that sense of the child. It was fascinating to hear that parents are 10 times more likely to chastise for tattling than for lying. And sometimes we just blow over line, right? We ask a child who drew on the wall, and we know darn well who drew on the wall in many cases. But we set them up in a situation where they lie to us, and then we don't even pay attention to that line. We just give them the consequence for, for drawing on the wall. So again, slowing it down, paying attention, what we're saying. So what's the take home, besides the ones that I've already shared? Parents' dishonesty is one of the most important, important traits in their children, and they don't respond as if it's true, and they don't see the intricacies, and they don't see the, the way that they model it. Talk about honesty in these situations. Slow down. For you parents who have, most, most of you have been through experiences where you're, this has been a problem in your relationship with your child, slow down and ask yourself, how am I reacting? Can I encourage truth-telling, even if it's hard to hear, right? And sometimes it comes out in an obnoxious way and in an angry way and in a way that's unpleasant to you. But can I slow it down? Can I reward it? Can I recognize my contribution to the discouragement of somebody telling the truth? I think this is an important thing in all of our relationships. When somebody doesn't tell us the truth, including a spouse, Yes, that's ultimately their responsibility, right? That's ultimately their responsibility to tell the truth. <clears throat> and can we pause? I encourage parents and spouses to do this all the time. Can we pause and say, what might I be doing to discourage the truth? When you tell me that you're not happy about something, you're upset, do I respond in, in, in a way to, to contain that? to provide adequate listening, to be patient, even if it hurts to hear, even if it's hard to hear? Do I make you responsible for my serenity, my anxiety, my pride, my well-being? Or do I allow for and encourage? One of the things my wife says to me, she says, when you tell me what, I, she says this very intentionally, when you tell me what I want to hear, you're unattractive to me. When you tell me, the truth, even when it's hard, you're more attractive to me. And she does this, of course. She's a therapist. She's very intentional about it. Hopefully some of the, the research, the science here can increase our empathy for children, not cause us to, to not be so anxious about it, to see it as developmental, to even see our participation in it, um, to understand the development of a child, 
that it's a part of it, that they're experimenting with self and relationship with, with others, to understand the mixed messages that we send, um, to, to understand shame, to understand that how impactful that is on all of us and, and how our children are going through psychologically some of the most difficult times, right, to fit in, especially teenagers. It is so important to them and, and to have empathy for that and to even own our own shame in this process. Owning your own shame and empathizing with your child and, and the difficulty with your own peer pressure is much, much more helpful. I tell that to parents all the time. Instead of giving your parents a lecture on peer pressure, share with them your, your struggles that you have today with peer pressure. Stop being a detective, right? Learn to have a, a parent's eye view, right? A 10,000 foot perspective. Take a step back. back. Stop being reactive. Start paying attention to the long moral arc in life. And, and when we become a detective and try to figure it out all the time. Again, there might be some people that are, are going to struggle with this because they tend to bury their head in the sand, right, to not see the truth. One of the things I thought fascinating about this chapter is there were so many parents, even the researcher himself talked about one example, one interaction with his child where this was the first lie that she told. And then he owned his reaction to it and how he could have done it better. And I'm thinking, really? You really think that's the first lie your three-year-old ever told? I don't have the inclination to, to, to trust my children to tell the truth. And that's not because I'm pessimistic. Right? Because maybe I'm in touch with my own human frailty in that area and I can see it. And, and I don't I don't get too attached to it one way or the other. I'm interested in, in the deeper process. Why are they lying? What's the shame? What's going on there? And, and so many, one, one participant in the research study that they were doing, it was fascinating. He was so eager when answering a, an ad in a parenting magazine to show off his honest young boy, four-year-old I think he was, maybe six, I'm not sure. He was so eager to show off his young truth-telling son. It was this, this over-identification, right? It was evidence of him, his goodness of a father that he raised a boy like this. And, of course, his boy was exposed as a boy, much like all the other boys his, his age. And he participated in the research studies as lying. So this idea that we need our children to be a certain way for us to be good, I think that's the vulnerability that leads to denial. When we awaken, like Carl Jung says, the great psychologist says, when we awaken and, and get in touch with our own darkness, our own issues, the demons that we're fighting, the dragons that we're doing battle with, we have so much more compassion, empathy, and capacity to see those in others, to see that struggle in others. And then reward honesty. But don't be frozen by it, right? You don't have to grant immunity all the time. But find ways to pay attention to and to reward honesty in given situations. But I have a lot of parents who think, and they get held hostage by their children, that I have to reward it 100% by, by granting full immunity. And you don't have to do that. You don't have to be frozen by the honesty. I'm going to put on my reading glasses to read this. Tonight's one of those nights. We've had a child, this is the first question. We've had a child who tells lies that are really negative. He tells people our family is in the mafia and that he has been to juvie or that he is, is, is from the rough area of town, which he is not. How does this make sense? His lies are never ever lies that make him look better, rather look worse. Well, and by the way, my son is 19 years old. Let me be clear. He looks better, worse to you. But again, the you, you're asking the right question, but... And this goes for all of you. I, when you ask the question of why, I want you to, to ask yourself, do I mean to find the answer? Or do I really mean that I just don't like it or I don't approve of it? Or it's stupid or shameful or I judge it. So there is a reason, right? In one context or another, everything that our children does, 
in one particular context, it makes perfect sense. And so what your son is putting on is a, is a bravado, a toughness, right? We, we call them um, uh, gated gangsters, right? Gated community gangsters, right? They live in, in a certain class but identify with, with a rougher, more criminal class. That's just a shell of armor to protect themselves from feeling vulnerable. If he looks mean and tough like an outlaw, then he's going to be less vulnerable to his peers. So, and in some circles, that even is cool. You know, I always used to say if, if we, the, my children actually said this to me last night, the way to make something uh, uncool is for parents to, to like it. The best way to help, I, I think, take away the, uh, the benefit, the secondary gain, is to understand and to name it. So I, I think it's just a great example. What I say is it's, it's the equivalent of, of why little children love the T-Rex, the Tyrannosaurus Rex. It's the most vicious predator, one of the most vicious predators that has ever walked on planet Earth. So why do little children like T-Rex, especially little boys often? Because it's tough. Because they identify with it and they don't have that sense of powerlessness. And that's probably what he's fighting. So you're asking all the right questions. But, but, but make sure, and this is hard for all of us, because I've used that why question thousands of times in my life. Make sure that you're open to the answer. All right, next question. What if honesty is breaking a boundary? For example, my 19-year-old admitted he is smoking weed. My boundary is he cannot stay in my home if he is using. He is refusing a drug screen. Again, one of my boundaries. He thinks he is, I'm trying to control him. I am not. I am trying to hold my boundary. He can use, but he can't stay with me if he does. I told him he could not stay in my home last night because he had been smoking marijuana. I know my wound of abandonment is being triggered. However, he did tell the truth. I, I think you could do both. I, I don't think, again, that them telling the truth means, means you get to be robbed of your boundaries. Uh, everything, for, by the way, I just want to compliment. Everything you just said is right on. You're okay doing that. You're allowed to do that. You're allowed to say, I'm not okay with it in my life. You can use if you want to. You just can't do it in my home. That's my boundary. You know, I had a parent say to me recently, and I was incredibly impressed by this idea. They set a boundary and they owned it as, as old fashioned. Maybe I'm being old fashioned. Maybe I'm being rigid. Maybe I'm being neurotic, but here's my boundary. And they did it without feeling bad about this themselves. They did it from a place of courage and authenticity. And what I said to this mother is I said, what I like about what you did is you did it from a place not of being right, but of being you. And that's beautiful. So great job. Great example. All right. I'm going to go over some of the upcoming announcements and events. And if there are any other questions, I'll take them at the end. We ask all parents to attend six 12-step support groups, specifically any combination of Al-Anon, CODA, or Families Anonymous. So you can go online to any of those websites and you can find meetings in your area. They're free. Right? Not a lot of this is free. And this is for people that, that have loved ones that are doing self-destructive, and in some cases very specifically drugs and alcohol, but it can be applied to any self-destructive behavior. You can also go to your local NAMI chapter, the National Alliance for Mental Illness, and, and get classes and resources in your area that are affordable. All of these webinars are broadcast and recorded on our podcast. So please subscribe to our podcast. Also, you can share the podcast with anybody. Um, you, can, you can go to the iOS device, your, your iPhone or Apple device, and go to the, the podcast app and search Evoke Therapy Programs and download and subscribe there. On Android devices, download the SoundCloud app and search Evoke Therapy Programs. On Twitter and Instagram, follow us on, on at Evoke Therapy. And on Facebook, you can search us, Evoke Therapy Programs. By the way, the, the social media that we do is, is more for information, staying in contact, announcements. Things get lost in email, emails get taken off of our, our announcements. So if you want to stay connected, even if you just subscribe to Twitter, just to follow a couple of people, this is an opportunity to make sure that you don't miss some of our announcements and some of the research, some of the articles, the blogs, the inspirational stories from other families, so on and so on. This, this is a special announcement tonight. The, the Second Nature Alumni Foundation on Facebook, go there. They're looking for new board members, okay? And they're looking actually to change the name. So if you want to give back, if you want to be involved in this organization, which helps people that can't afford therapy or treatment, 
go to the Second Nature Alumni Foundation on Facebook. In fact, the most recent blog, well, the one that was actually published yesterday by Stephanie, Stephanie Lewis, because she's on the board, was all about this. So go to our blog and look there, and Stephanie tells you where to go to, to become involved if you want to. So they're looking for new board members. They need new board members. We can do a lot better with, with helping people that can't afford treatment. And of course, go to our, our blog to read inspirational stories and articles. My book is available on Amazon. Go to Amazon.com. You can also go and to Amazon to purchase an audio version through Audible or, or by buying the CD set. Workshops will, will announce the Entrada ones coming up, but so far the next one is January 20th and 21st at Cascades. We ask all current parents, if you possibly can come, to come to at least one, and we do them about every six weeks, so this may fall somewhere in your stay. Contact Gail at evoketherapy.com for more information or to RSVP. The next Finding You Intensive workshop. If you want to do deeper work, these are fantastic life-giving experiences, wonderful four days of your life. Uh, the next one is January 11th through 14th. For those of you on social media or, or who have seen the, the recent email blast, we just have our own new beautiful space. It's a wonderful place up in Park City, not too far from the airport, comfortable, um, and, and just a really sacred place for you to be able to do mindfulness, psychodrama, do your own deeper work if you want to do it. Contact the intensives at evoketherapy.com for more information or call admissions. If you want to do a private family intensive with me, you can also contact those same numbers. The upcoming support groups that we have on the calendar in the Bay Area, Wednesday, January 10th, 630 to 8. This is a special one. We're doing it in conjunction with Palo Alto Preparatory School. I'll be speaking there um, then. So if you want to come, uh, email Andrea at evoketherapy.com. And then in New York City, we'll be back on Monday, January 22nd, 7 to 9 p.m. in our usual spot at the City University of New York on 365 Fifth Avenue, right across from the Empire State Building. Pursuit trips are for families or young adults who want sober fun. Any other questions before we close tonight? No other questions. Thank you for joining us on our 10-year anniversary in one day. I'm very grateful to be able to do these. We're great, very grateful, very happy to be able to provide these for the rest of your life. Uh, you have subscription, free subscription to these as long as you live, as, as, as long as we're doing them, you have access to these. And the podcasts are available to anybody. So thank you for joining us. Thank you for and on behalf of your children. Have a great couple of days, and I'll see you on Thursday. The next one will be part three. I'll be talking about the science of teen rebellion from Nurture Shock. Have a great couple of days. See you in 48 hours. Take care. Bye-bye.